Welcome everyone. We're so excited to broadcast here from California Botanic Garden and we love connecting people with California native plants. That's that's really a core part of our mission and native foods are an absolutely fabulous way to do that. And I'm, I'm excited to introduce uh, Abe Sanchez a little bit later, but uh, there is this amazing native foods movement that's being led by uh, uh, remarkable indigenous people. There's an amazing legacy associated with uh, native foods and it is very much alive and Abe has been at the forefront of that movement here in California with the Chia Cafe Collective. Um, so today we're going to be enjoying some fabulous desserts that Phyllis Russell has made from As You Like It Catering. Hi Phyllis. Hi. <laughs> Uh, Phyllis has been just an absolute pleasure to work with, and I just can't say enough about her culinary uh, abilities, but also just she's just so so warm and wonderful to work with. So thank you for being such thank a Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are also joined by Naomi Fraga, our Director of Conservation Programs. She's, she leads an amazing series of programs on behalf of conserving um, our California native plants out in our wildlands, here at the garden in our seed bank, and through many other initiatives. So um, I want to a gift for a formal introduction later, but hi, Naomi. Hello. Hi, everybody. And we also have Danielle Wildeson, my fabulous colleague in visitor experience, and she's going to be our moderator today. So she's going to help uh, facilitate any questions. Um, so uh, we are uh, going to get started in just a second here. Um, I wanted to describe the episode structure a little bit. Um, uh, we are going to, I'm going to pass it over to Phyllis. I'd love for her to just uh, introduce as you like it. Um, and then I'm going to pass the mic really over to Abe Sanchez from Chia Cafe, and he's going to give us um, a, a little bit of backstory about the Chia Cafe Collective, uh, the importance of native foods in uh, indigenous culture, but also in contemporary context. And then we're going to get rolling. We're going to start tasting. So as we taste, uh, we're going to enjoy the food together, and we can kind of comment on it. Phyllis is going to describe the recipe a little bit, and then Abe will talk about the culinary applications, uh, cultural legacies, and other uh, facets about these native plant ingredients. And then Naomi Fraga will talk about the ecological context of these species, which is really important to talk about. Um, so thanks again, thanks so much for joining us. Um, so yeah, let's get to it. Uh, Phyllis, can you just uh, d describe as you like it, your, your culinary philosophy and uh, about your wonderful company? Sure, um, thank you. Um, we're really happy to be part of this event. Um, my name is Phyllis Russell. I'm one of um, two partners for As You Like It. We're a full service catering and event management company. We're one of the preferred caterers at the garden. So it's been just wonderful being able to do events there. And especially this one is really special for us. Um, our philosophy for food is we love food, um, but we also cook from scratch, you know, so we don't always take the easy way we frequently take the hardest way it seems like, but um, it's just our thing. We like to make things um, from essential ingredients and not just buy things frozen in a box and thawed out for people. It's not how we do. Um, so for this event, um, we did a little bit of recipe, recipe development on uh, three of the desserts. The Sonoran cookies were great, um, just the way the recipe came to us. Um, so that one didn't change that at all. The other three, we did a little tweaking. So. Um, that's about it. And then we started cooking. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. It, it's been quite an adventure and you have been the best partner to do it with. So thank you. Thank um, you. And, uh, we're we're going to do a little bit of lead up to Abe. I can't wait to introduce Abe, but I want to take a moment and just, uh, again, mention Naomi Fraga. Naomi leads our conservation teams here and does really amazing work. So Naomi, would you be able to introduce yourself in the programs that you lead here at California Botanic Garden? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, so I uh, direct the conservation programs, um, which is a very diverse um, set of um, activities we do here at the garden that range from field research to research in the, the labs, both molecular lab and anatomy lab. Uh, we have the largest seed bank dedicated to California native plants, which is just a tremendous resource for the state. So we're storing genetic diversity on site at the garden um, as a backup to all the great diversity we have in the wild. And we also have an incredible restoration nursery where we propagate plants for uh, restoration efforts, both rare and common species, and also do um, restoration on the ground. And then we have uh, crews that do invasive plant management. And so all those things together really make for a great diverse program and I'm really happy to be a part of it. And one of my passions is um, 
outreach um, and getting people to appreciate plants. So one of the best ways we can appreciate plants is by enjoying them in tasty treats. Uh, so <laughs> I'm really excited to be a part of this event to share my knowledge about California native plants and um, link that to the, their legacy um, in culture and our food. Thank you very much. And I want to say it's, it's a real, real honor to have Abe Sanchez join us. Um, my kind of journey with California native plants started, uh, I would say, maybe five or five or six years ago. And I found my way into this amazing world through uh, cooking and through finding these amazing flavors in native plants that I had never kind of discovered before. And to me, I thought this whole world existed out there and had never really been discovered. And that is the farthest thing from the truth. <laughs> so native plants have a tremendous uh, legacy and are so intertwined with California Native American culture. Um, and it's been an amazing journey for me to uh, um, understand how, how integral that is with uh, Native American um, culinary traditions. And it has been a, a really amazing way to build a relationship with Native plants, to not just see them as resources, uh, but to see them as um, these really beautiful organisms that deserve to live all on their own. And we can enjoy these amazing flavors by growing them in our own yards, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Um, but Abe Sanchez, again, has been at the forefront of this movement um, of sharing native foods, of sharing their health benefits, of the sustainable ways that they, uh, they might be future foods. And I sure, certainly hope they will be. Um, I think it's imperative that they are and that they're also incredibly tasty, as we'll see today in the uh, dessert box. So I want to pass it over to Abe Sanchez, again, an amazing member of the Chia Cafe Collective. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Abe, and I want to throw it to you for our keynote address. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, guys, and thank you for having me here at uh, California Botanical Garden. And also, I've always um, honored the, uh, the Tongva people of this land. We always want to acknowledge them, of course. So I wanted to give thanks to them and some of the foods that they ate ancestral here that we're going to talk about. Um, a little bit about, about Chia Cafe Collective. Remember, I am a member of 10 of us. So I'm um, a group of us, Barbara Drake, Craig Torres, um, Jane McCarthy, Deborah Small, Tima, Link, um, Heidi Perez, and Leslie um, Mozambique. And um, so there's a group of us who actually kind of got together and just all of a sudden came about and started finding the importance and the beauty of these native foods that were all around us. And um, in the years that we've been doing this, some of the things I really want to cover is just kind of like what's worked for us and what hasn't worked for us. Because a lot of what we've been trying to do is try to revitalize these foods within Native communities. And I think what I'm really thrilled about this with Phyllis and you coming up with these great recipes and tweaking them as they need to be tweaked, which is what you need to do anyway with these foods, is just that. Because when we first started doing this, we were trying to reintroduce some of these Native foods into the community and found that people weren't really receiving them very well. We were kind of preparing them in the traditional way and finding that people's pellets have changed and people weren't really ready to eat them or they taste them and they would be turned off and they wouldn't want to taste them again. So we figured, okay, so I think we need to come up with different um, ways and how we're going to get people to, to um, uh, make these foods. And the infusion that's now taking place is a process that kind of works with these cookies, as you know, and these foods that we've made. Obviously, as you know, this is not traditional food, but it's traditional native California additives that we've added to it. And we kind of use it in our book as well, which we develop our little um, cookbook here. Um, and uh, again, you can, I know that the, they do sell it here. They will, or they do sell it at the bookstore. You can also find it online. It's Eating the Native Way. Great, great pictures. Deborah Small Link, Deborah um, Small and um, and Tima Link put this together. Beautiful piece of art and pictures and recipes. So again, it's that. So it's kind of um, so there, that's what we kind of got into getting people to um, you know eat these foods. And we found that in order for us to kind of get people used to this, is when we started to infuse these these foods. Like for example, on our covers, you saw our pancake. This is your basic pancake recipe, but we added mesquite flour to it. Um, it's somewhere we get people to taste. Um, in addition to that, as we've gone about this also too, is that we started preaching the importance of these food and they're great and stuff, whatever, but we started finding other barriers as well, where accessibility to these foods was another big issue that we found. We would say, oh, hey, you know, you can eat this, you can eat that. The big question was, where do I get it? 
Well, we found that, you know, of course, they're in nature, they're out in the hills, stuff, whatever. But um, there you have to be careful in the fact that, you know, you can be fine if you're out there collecting some of these foods. And not only that, the concern of over harvesting some of these native plants is another big concern that we have too, which we have to be, you know, we're kind of looking into that. This is the beat about this that we will cover it as well too, is that some of these plants, and at least the ones we're talking about here, are plants that you can grow in your own home. These are, you can even grow these in a pot on your balcony if you live in an apartment, wherever it might be. So this is one of the things that you know, we try to cover there. So accessibility was one. Um, and again, they're trying to get people to learn you know, uh, from that. We also find that um, a little, there was fear in the fact of people trying to learn how to identify these edible plants. That was a big concern where people were not willing to go out there and even though they have the permit or whatever it might be or their, or their interest, the concern was whether it's gonna be poisonous or not. You know, of course, in movies, you've seen that people eat these foods, they get poisoned, stuff, whatever. So there's been a lot of negativity away already. And it's us just trying to kind of get people over that and learning that. So it's getting people to uh, agree with the taste and make it, you know, get used to it. Um, and again, whether it's safe or not. The foods that we have here, or the native um, products that we have here are, are safe are pretty easy to identify. We're gonna have sample, I'm gonna have pictures to show you some of them. And of course, in today's world, many of these, you can just Google and find the information. Um, you know, there's websites and there's apps that you can take pictures of and send it to other people and help you identify what these plants are. If you're overly concerned of picking the right, the wrong uh, food product, whatever it might be. So there is, there is that. Another one too would be not only accessibility, but again, like I said, it's getting people to taste it, um, like I'd mentioned earlier. So yeah, um, that and um, would be pretty much um, what I would want to cover there. Um, and then, um, yeah, so we can go into our tasting. I think Fabulous. Well, yeah, thank our... you so much, Abe. Well, I hope you all got your beautiful box. This is so <laughs> exciting. Um, so we're going to go ahead and open ours. <laughs> I've, I've already opened like four, but I'm still just as excited. <laughs> um, so this one's in, official, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so in this, in this box, there is a recipe card, which you might have already perused. And the recipes from today's tastings are in these cards. And we want to thank uh, Phyllis for providing these recipes, as well as Naomi for adapting uh, one of the recipes <laughs> of the Sonoran cookie from uh, Desert Harvest. So uh, these are really great. Um, and we're going to kind of get into how you can cultivate your own plants for these recipes, which are really easy. I grow a bay laurel in a pot, for instance. It's a big tree, but you can grow it in a pot, and you only need a couple leaves per, uh, per a recipe. So uh, there, we're not only going to taste these and really enjoy them, but we're going to give you some options for how you can uh, continue eating these delicious uh, in ingredients and uh, dishes um, at the end of the segment. All right, so without further ado, uh, we want to start with the Sonoran cookie. So the Sonoran okay. cookie is this wonderful little, yes, oh my gosh, let's open it and enjoy it. <laughs> okay. And while we do, um, mm -hmm. I would love for Phyllis to discuss her experience cooking it and preparing it. Oh, yeah. Okay, so this, this was a lot of fun to make, actually. Um, I love this recipe, and it does have the option to add nuts to it, and I think that would be a really nice addition. I decided not to add anything to it, so you can really taste the, um, the mesquite flour. It does have an, a unique flavor, but I think um, the texture is also really important on this cookie. Um, it's got a nice, almost a ginger snap kind of um, taste, you know, and I'll tell you that the first batch that we made was a full, like, week ago, and I tried another cookie on Monday, and it was great. It was, it held up really well, you know, just um, sealed up at room temperature, so I would say this would be a great cookie, you know, if you make cookies for the holidays, um, throw a little cinnamon in there, a little bit of ginger, it would be wonderful. Um, it would also be good with a little maybe molasses or honey. Um, maple syrup would be a nice addition to it. But I, I enjoyed that cookie a lot. Um, yeah, it's, oh my that's God. That's about <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Phyllis, the, yeah. the mesquite flavor really comes through on the cookie. Yes. I've yeah. had it in a lot of different recipes and it's very, the, well, I've had this cookie before, but your preparation yeah. is especially good. And yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of yeah. fun that also, it also has masa in it, which is which is nice. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. It, yeah. it would be a gluten-free cookie, you know, if you're yes. worried about that. Um, and I think it wouldn't be too hard to make it vegan as well. 
although it does have egg in it, but you know, just a little tweaking and you could do that. So, yeah. Well, one variation I have tried, you mentioned the nuts um, and on the recipe card it says walnuts, mm -hmm. walnut cans, yes. but I've also put pin pinion nuts. Pine, pine nuts. nuts, yes. Yeah, which that is would really be nice. nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We I have made a plant. <laughs> <laughs> do you? <laughs> We have a really good question. Someone asked, where do you get mesquite flour? So that's a great question. I want to, sorry, you, Abe, you beat me to it. I wanted to throw it to Abe <laughs> to talk to us about mesquite uh, culturally and you know, culinarily. So Abe, take us through um, mesquite. Okay, again, here's just a brief sample of the plant. It's actually a tree. This, to me, in the, uh, the research and learning I've done, this is a food of the future. This is going to save a little longer here. This, this for us today. It's a tree that grows in the desert, um, Sonoran species. This one that we're using is the honey mesquite and maybe later on, not only you can give us a botanical name, but it's known as honey mesquite. Um, this is gathered from the Seri Indians in Sonora, Mexico. So it's, it's uh, gathered on the reservation. Um, and again, so organic as well. To me, one of my favorite food sources and a food source for the, for the future and the fact that not only is it abundant and like I said, some of the foods that we talked about, this is a tree that grows in the desert. This is a tree that does not plant, that does not need to be watered. It gets watered by the monsoons. But let me back up a little bit because most people um, know of mesquite. Right away that you think of mesquite, you think of mesquite barbecue, right? What they do is to make the barbecues, they cut the tree down, they make charcoal, and then they cook your steak. And that's when you get the mesquite flavor. Well, that tree actually produces, it's a legume family. This is actually the pods that it grows. And this is the plant kind of looks for that. This is the flowers right here, if you can see them. So this is, again, gathered in a harvest, been used by native people for thousands of years, super nutritional. Today, what they're finding that it's not only it's high in fiber, mucilaginous, which can, you know, clean your intestines, um, almost like, you know, like, like taking psyllium kind of thing. And it also is good for diabetics and the fact that it neutralizes your blood sugar. So what it means, it just keeps you full longer, longer to digest. I encourage those people who are going to experiment and trying this, start off a little bit. You don't need too much of it at the beginning. Traditionally, the way it was eaten, it was roasted. Again, you, what you need to do is you need to roast it in the oven or before it was roasted in, in, in a pit of hot sand or, or, or might have been. And then, but at home, what you could do is you roast it in the oven until it finally snaps, nice crack snaps. You're right now, it just kind of bends, but when it's been roasted, it's just gonna snap, that means it's done. Use your blender, blend it up, okay? And after that, and you're pretty much going to have to sift it. And, and if you have a good blender, you're pretty much just going to get the outer core. If you're good enough to get the seed, that's good. Um, we have one of those Vitamix, which works pretty good, but doesn't quite get the seed. But it's pretty much, you know, you get that. Keep it in the refrigerator. For some reason, if you can see the little holes on it, mesquite, for some reason, has a lot of little bugs. They'll get it, whatever, but don't let that bother you. Um, once you roast them, you're okay. Um, Mesquite is, there's a lot of different species, a lot of different varieties. Interesting is that today, if you go out looking for it, you can find it online, but what's coming in online right now is a species coming in from South America, which is good, but to me, I, um, it's, it's the one who is, they're, at the, it's, they're, they're processing and they're, they have it on market and stuff, whatever, and that's the one which you're most gonna find on the market today. This one's a little more hard to get, we have a lot of it in the Southwest here. Like I said, it's reached stretch from, from Palm Springs all the way to Arizona, all the way down into Mexico. So it's a wide range of this plant, of this tree. Again, grows, it grows in its native you know, desert dry areas. Um, so again, it's getting people to, um, to, because we don't have a big demand at this time for mesquite flour, the one coming in right now, like you said, is from South America. Um, where do you get it? Um, there's, again, question, but there is a, there are in our cookbook we have, but there is, for example, the Tohono Autumn um, Co-op in Arizona, outside of Tucson, Arizona. It's there and they do sell it out of their um, market. Um, Native Seed Search in Tucson sells it as well, um, depending on how much supply they have. Um, so it's a little harder to get um, other than if you, find areas where you can gather it and so forth. Um, it is a legume. Probably the only disadvantage of this is that 
you can get an allergy kind of like a peanut, but again, don't worry about you guys because this has been tested, okay? This was gathered by the Sari and um, Laura, wife of um, Gary Nabhan, actually had it all tested for that. And what it is, it's the same thing like a peanut reaction people might get, but again, and it's a uh, little fungus that's gonna grow on it, so whatever, but again, this is clean, this has been tested for that. It's probably only, but what you wanna do to avoid that is you wanna get the, you wanna gather the mesquite before it hits the ground. So once it's ready, usually about late mid summer, you go out there and you gather the beans when they're ready to, when they're dry. You can also get them when they're green, you can boil them up, you can make a syrup as well. Um, you can eat, uh, but again, and interesting too about the plant, um, easy to grow, um, in most areas, and no one may, may be helping with this. I'm not sure if they're going to need a male female tree on the, on the mesquite. I'm not sure about that, but I do know that the Sari, where they gather their mesquite, they go back to the same tree because one tree can be sweeter than the other. So they usually remember which one to go back to. I mean, you, they're all edible, they're all good, but for some reason, some of the trees end up being sweeter than the other. And I kind of did a taste test in that. We were going through the Sonora, and I would go pick. Everything I saw as a mesquite tree, I would taste one. And sure enough, there were some that was just like eating candy. You can eat them when they're green. And then others that were just not as sweet. So yes, it does kind of have a, a little personality when they can be different flavors in different uh, places. But well, again, hey, I'm, gonna be, I'm gonna be the villain um, just for sake of time. That is so fabulous. Um, I wanna give Naomi like about two minutes to talk about uh, the ecological context of mesquite and maybe honey mesquite, but also some of these other species that Abe's talking about in the desert. Yeah, so um, the species of mesquite that we're eating is the honey mesquite. That scientific name is Prosopis glandulosa. It occurs across the desert southwest. So from our deserts in California, across, you know, through Arizona, all the way to Texas, it's very widespread and was used very widely across that region by um, native peoples. Um, and it occurs, um, in terms of its habitat and ecological context, it occurs primarily along waterways in what we call riparian areas. Um, and also though, in areas where there's a high groundwater table. And so it's a good indication that there's water in the environment, whether the water is flowing above ground or the water is actually deep down below ground. And uh, in certain areas where groundwater has dropped, the mesquite is actually a good indication that that's happened because the trees actually will start to die. Um, and so um, it's, it's, uh, it forms these really lush thickets and stands that are very, very thorny. So you don't want to get caught up in a mesquite um, <laughs> a thicket because it, it's very harmful to your skin <laughs> with the thorns. Um, but uh, yeah, it's very um, important ecologically um, in um, along waterways and um, very widespread species. Great, thank you so much. All right, so to kind of uh, take our palates in a different direction, we're gonna try these really delicious elderflower lemon tarts. Uh, so they're in these beautiful little shells here and uh, please enjoy. <laughs> and while we do, Phyllis uh, made this beautiful recipe. And so I just wanna have her tell us a little bit about it. Okay, if I could just add one note on the cookies, um, just for shaping them into actual cookies from the dough. I found that the dough was really crumbly what, before it was cooked, so I did add a little bit of cream at the end, you know, just to help shape them, hold them together. Um, so moving on to the elderflower tart. Um, the, it's, the recipe that I used is a soft um, tart dough, and so we, we par-baked that first, just for about five minutes in those small shells. And then the filling is very similar to a lemon bar that we make, um, but we subbed out about 30% of the lemon juice um, with the lemon, I'm sorry, with the lemon elderflower syrup. So um, the cordial. So that's where the flower flavor comes from. And it's really, a, it's a delicate flavor. Um, the lemon is definitely the dominant flavor in this dessert. Um, but if you just, you know, smell it and you'll, you'll, it's almost more of an aroma than, um, than a very clear flavor. It's a, a kind of a perfume. It's a beautiful tree. Um, I have one in my backyard. <laughs> it's going nuts right now, so it's really pretty. Awesome. Um, beautiful tree, yeah. 
Thank you. Thank That's you. All I got. <laughs> and the desserts are beautiful too. I have to tell you the uh, you, yeah. uh, the um, color of the elderflower cordial and even the elderflower blossoms, as you can see, Abe's mm. holding those up there. Yes. Uh, the, it's, it just mirrors the beautiful sunny kind of color of mm -hmm. the dessert. So it's very beautiful for spring and just such a nice kind yeah. of palate cleanser. Yeah, very so vibrant. Yeah, and if you do make this, I would, it, it's much easier to make one large tart than a bunch of small ones. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, I'd say make, go big um, and then just cut it up. But you know, for this event, we did mini tarts. So. Right. Yeah. All, all right, Abe, I want to toss it to you. Tell us about elderflower. Elderflower. Um, but again, before, as a disclaimer, I'm not a physician, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a physician or a botanist or a herbalist. But um, this is a medicinal plant. Um, you can consult your, uh, your uh, herbalist or your physician. I mean, it is good for the flu and colds, okay? So there's that use in that one and so forth. Um, but the benefits of this, but the interesting thing about this is that I've traveled many places around the world and it's everywhere. This is used all over the world. Um, here among native people, um, of course, very important plant in the fact that the wood was used for the musical instruments, for the clapper sticks. Um, you can actually eat the flower as well. Right now, in this perfect time, you can make fritters. You just don't want to eat the green part of it, but you can make a little batter and kind of dip them in that, kind of fry them. Um, but this was, again, uh, made into a tea and used for, you know, um, sort of lung, sort of cough, sort of um, medication kind of thing. Um, but um, the fruit, multi-purpose you can eat you can make wine out of it you can make jam out of it um what i like about elderberry is it is it is an abundant plant it's a plant too that like everything's going to be at risk but it's a plant that grows pretty easy very easy to grow in a, in a pot um actually in the ground you have to be careful where you put it in the ground because it will take over and it will grow to a big size so you have to be cautious not to be careful about that but again multi-purpose it's getting used to it. it's getting used to the um I mean, the, the, the fruit is, it's sweet. It's gathering at the right time. Like I said, um, you can make the wine, you can make the, we made the jelly with it. We made syrup with it. Um, so many uses with this, with the fruit, except, except. I know that the natives also use the whole um, leaves and bark and everything part to, um, to dye their junk is black, for example. So it's also a dye material for the basketry materials, as you see the black designs on Southern California basketry, which used for that. Sometimes come out, comes out a little red, but again, a very abundant plant. Um, one that, again, like all we have to be concerned about, you know, a lot of migratory birds do eat the berries as well. Of course, it does, you know, produce a lot. The bees right now, so forth, whatever. So it does, you know, depend on a lot of wildlife and stuff, whatever. But then again, this is one plant, like I said, that I like the fact that there is an abundance of it. And it's something that's very easy to grow. Um, and again, just even so easy that caution where you plant it because it will take over. <laughs> Beautiful, thanks, Abe. And and Naomi, can you take us through uh, some of the science behind and ecology behind uh, our native elderberry? Sure. Well, I want to start with a little taxonomic note on the uh, blue elderberry. Uh, the scientific name is uh, Sambucus nigra, subspecies cerula. Um, some of you may know, may have known it as Mexican elderberry or Sambucus mexicana, um, but that name was misapplied, and so that the correct name is uh, Sambucus nigra subspecies cerula. Uh, it is a species that actually um, is very fast growing, uh, so if you establish it in your yard, it will take off relatively soon and is a small shrub to small, a large shrub to small tree. Uh, it occurs also, it's a, uh, like the mesquite, it's also associated with waterways and often occurs near creeks or streams or areas where there's a little bit more water. And it's a species that actually has a pretty wide amplitude in the different habitats it occurs in. You can find it in chaparral at lower elevation or near a coastal sage scrub. Uh, for instance, it grows at the field station right next to the garden. Um, but you can also find it in montane environments um, in Jeffrey Pine Forest. So it can occur across a wide elevational gradient. Uh, it's also a very important plant for wildlife. Birds really love this tree. They'll nest in it. You know, it provides berries. Um, it's also a very important food plant for a lot of mammals like deer and so forth. So it just uh, provides a lot of benefit um, in the habitats that it occurs in. Great, thank you very much. Um, all right, so the third dessert, and this might be one of my favorites. Uh, 
This is the Bay Laurel pound cake. And I love Bay Laurel so much. Isn't it amazing that we have a native California Bay Laurel species here in the Golden State? And uh, because California is the greatest place in the world, our Bay Laurel is three times stronger than the European variety. <laughs> right? um, and there's so much to say about Bay Laurel. I love that. Uh, I love that this is a perennially green plant. It's evergreen, and it is one of the most aromatic plants that you'll ever encounter in California. Just so delightful. And I think that this recipe, more than any other I've tried, and I've ruined so many dishes with bay laurel because it's so strong. You have to you have to use uh, a yeah. third the amount of native bay that you would yeah. than the European variety. Um, but I just think that this this pound cake just is great. It just really celebrates the flavor of bay laurel and it captures it in just the right way. So I hope you enjoy. And while you're enjoying, I want to pass it over to Phyllis to tell us about the recipe. Okay, so so this was another um, pretty easy one to make. Um, we tried it a couple of different ways. Um, this was the winner. Um, so it has an orange zest in it. Um, the other recipe that we tried used coconut milk instead of cream in the recipe. I rather like that one. Um, if you wanted to try it that way, just one to one, just substitute the coconut milk instead of the half and half or the cream in the recipe. And you could also, you know, sprinkle a little bit of toasted coconut on top when you're done. So if you like coconut, that, that'd be kind of a nice way to go. Um, orange zest is optional. Um, I think it really actually pairs nicely with the bay. Um, so I'm hoping you're detecting the bay yeah. in the pound cake. Um, it would help a lot I think if you, next time you go to the garden, find the bay laurel tree and just go there and smell it. And then you're like, okay, that's it. You know, it has a, it has a bit of a eucalyptus um, uh, pungency to it. Um, yeah, so it's, it's definitely strong. Um, yeah, we learned that making it. <laughs> so, um, right. yeah, but it was a fun, fun recipe to make. I, you know, it um, makes a standard loaf pan, so yeah. Yeah, and just perfectly moist. I just love the, yeah. and yeah, the orange zest is just such a nice touch to it. I, I wouldn't yeah. even have even considered that. Um, so Abe, can you tell us a little bit about bay laurel? Well, bay laurel, amazing plant, beautiful tree, like you said, it's an evergreen. Um, grows very well in a pot. I know uh, one of our co collector members, Deborah Small, has had a tree in a pot for years. She just prunes it every so often and keeps it copious and it does real well. Natives use this for many purposes. The actual seed, that little pot here that you see, the little seed, was a food source, the nut. Um, they were either boiled, eaten that way, or among the Pomo up north, or also, they were also roasted and charred. Okay, well, you have to take the little peel on the, on the, on the outside, and it's like a little nut inside, and they were roasted. You can also do it in your oven as well, until they're almost, you know, almost not, not quite burnt, but really well toasted. Crack them open like that. Very nutty, very nutty flavor. So again, it was a food source. Uh, a medicinal plant, the pomo would also use it. I know up north I read that they would get a leaf and they would crush it and stick it up a nostril in case uh, you had the flu and stuff, whatever. I tried it, you guys, don't do it. It feels like if I took a bite of a wasabi. <laughs> so again, um, I caution you that, again, not to encourage you to do it. But, um, but yes, it's one of those. Um, the wood, a very important food, wood, wood um, bowls were made out of it, weapon, you know, weapons, tools were made out of it, so a very good wood. Even today, a lot of artists still use the wood in manufacturing certain bowls out of this. So again, um, I like to use it, not only that, is also, um, if you're not too crazy about mothballs, you can also put some of this in your drawers when you have your wool, um, sweaters and so forth, whatever. Not just one lead, you kind of want to add a good amount, maybe like a good you know, good chunk like that in your drawers and the bottom, whatever. And this is supposed to help keep all those little, all those little bugs out and stuff, whatever. So it works as well there. So again, a super um, interesting plant, easy to grow, grows in pots. And um, again, multi-purpose use, uh, beautiful wood. And again, I, again, they the flavors that we get, and I don't know, Phyllis, if you kind of got this, um, they say in comparison to the European one, which is the one that we were bringing first before this was actually, this, this in California is not really used um, in culinary. We, it can be used, but it's not because we use a lot the one, the European one that they're bringing that we still use today. But this can be used the same way. And this is a lot stronger. And I think maybe not only that it's fresher, that we're going to get it here, you're going to get a much more robust flavor. So again, better easy to 
to gather. So yes, yay for the um, bay leaf. Thank you, Abe. Um, Naomi, can you share a little bit about the ecology of our beautiful bay laurel? Sure. So the scientific name for bay laurel is Umbellularia californica. It's also commonly known as the California bay. Uh, so this does turn into a large tree in the wild. And in Southern California, it has quite a patchy distribution. Um, and it's usually restricted to areas that have perennial water in Southern California. But in Northern California, it can form the dominant component of forests. And so it can occur across a, a wider area and is not necessarily restricted uh, to waterways. Uh, one of the local places you can find it uh, in our area is um, in some of the canyons in the San Gabriel Mountains. So for instance, in the uh, Claremont Hills Wilderness Park, um, where there's perennial water, you will find the bay laurel. Um, it occurs from Southern Oregon um, all the way down here to Southern California. We're pretty much at the Southern end of its distribution. And it's in the family of Lauraceae. So like Abe mentioned, um, there's the typical bay plant that we use in our cooking. We, a recipe might call for two bay leaves for, that's the species um, uh, Loris nobilis. Um, and it's in the same family. So they're both in the family Lauraceae. And that is a really fun food family. Um, it also includes avocado. And uh, Abe had a, um, a plant and it had a fruit on it. And if you look at the, the bay laurel fruit, it actually looks a lot like a mini avocado. And so you can see that they're in the same family. And they have that, they share that family resemblance. Interesting. Yeah, just so, just so wonderful. And I, I think uh, what's so alluring about many of our native plants here in Southern California is that ar aromatic quality. I like to say we kind of live in a veritable spice rack of, of aromas and fragrances. Um, and so bay laurel is just one of those all-star uh, herbs that you can use in culinary applications. And I've used it in pasta, like even like a macaroni and cheese to elevate it. And oh my God, it's so, so delicious. So it doesn't have to be just limited to desserts. Uh, it's, a, it's a really, really great flavor. All right, well, okay, Pen Ultimate, here's the fudge. Um, on, oh, yeah. Does Danielle, do you have a question? Yes, we have two great questions that we got about our pound cake here. The first one is for um, Phyllis. Someone was asking if you could repeat the um, coconut milk substitution. Yes. Okay, so, so in the recipe for the pound cake, um, it calls for cream um, as one of the, the wet ingredients. So if you don't want to use that, you just sub open up a can of coconut milk and just use the same amount of coconut milk in place of the cream. Perfect. So it gives, it's a nice, delicate flavor. Um, yeah. Perfect, thank you. And then our second question here, someone wants to know how big bay laurels grow in a pot versus in the ground. It's a good question. I mean, my, mine is probably about five feet tall in the pot, but I, I keep it uh, kind of headed off uh, and just kind of prune it as, as necessary. Uh, but they do get large, like in the ground, they can get upwards of 30 feet, if not taller than that, in their natural range. So, Naomi, do you want to maybe speak to what you've seen bay laurels do? <laughs> yeah, no, like you said, in the wild, they're 20, 30 feet, very tall, robust trees. Um, but, you know, you can find the root system and a plant will, you know, it won't get out of control if it doesn't have the space to do it. Right. I, I find it really interesting, like in some of the kind of archaeology of early Spanish uh, adobes and places in California, they, they find the native bay laurel was planted in courtyards as, a, as an herb, which I find kind of interesting. Um, all right, so the next, the next plant, uh, or sorry, the next dessert is this delicious black sage fudge. Black sage is just amazing, and I think uh, maybe probably the best sage for uh, sweet applications. So this beautiful dessert here, uh, I hope you're enjoying it right now. Um, but black sage um, is a very, uh, it's probably the most common sage in California. And like I said, it just has a wonderful aroma that can be used in all types of sweet dishes. I find it pairs really well with dairy. I've made a great ice cream with it. At least I think it's great. <laughs> um, but I'm so just delighted with this, uh, this uh, fudge. So Phyllis, can you take us through this wonderful dessert? Yeah, so, so the first batch of fudge that we made, we did old school and it, it took a really long time. So this recipe is very simple. It's um, sweetened condensed milk and chocolate chips. Um, so the better the chocolate chip that you use, the better your result will be. Um, this is a semi-sweet chocolate chip. Um, 
And another tip that we found making it um, is to actually go ahead and turn your oven on and melt the chocolate chips in a pan in the oven. It just takes a few minutes and that really speeds up the whole process quite a bit. Um, rather than combining it in a pot and stirring it forever, you know, waiting for your chocolate chips to melt. So um, just heat your uh, sweetened condensed milk on the stove, melt your chocolate chips in a pan in the oven, and then combine the two. It just, it was so much easier. This is my tip <laughs> for you. <laughs> yeah, but the sage, um, we, we put fresh sage inside the, uh, the fudge, and then we decided to go ahead and, um, mainly to make it last a little bit better, we fried the sage um, leaves to put on to crumble up and put on the top. So it, that made the change the flavor a little bit because um, you get the toasted butter flavor, and then um, it definitely changed the texture. So it's um, delicate and crispy on the top. So a couple of different ways to do the the sage. Thank you, and it's just so beautiful. Yeah. The toppings with the dragon. Yeah, it's pretty. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. yeah. I'm kind of feeling it. I'm kind of feeling it. <laughs> And stuff. It's, I mean, it's good yeah. feeling. You know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, this again um, in the salvia family, and, and what I was talking about earlier about identifying things that are edible. All the salvias are okay for you to eat. Um, they're all edible and they're all safe to eat. Um, the interesting thing about this again, these salvia, this one in particular again was also a medicinal plant, also for flus, for chest kind of things. And I, and I kind of noticed when I took a bite myself too, I kind of felt it kind of like you know, a little that, that I felt the little feeling of um, the, the, the vapor kind of thing coming down. So yeah, natives used it um, for that, um, as well as other herbs, you know, relative to chia, relative to the, to the mint family. Um, so that tells you that, you know, it's okay. Um, the, the um, according, the, 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 one of the good things about this is also the seed was edible. This is a, um, a, um, seed beater that would have been used. Uh, this will probably, be, with as good rains that we have, we should also have maybe like mid-June, July, when the seeds are ripe, you'll also be able to gather the seeds in that area for this plant as well. But it's another plant that we also like to be concerned about, that it is in the same growing conditions as white sage. And as you know, maybe you might've heard Deborah Smalls and, and Rosie Ramirez has talked about how white sage is being wiped out. This grows in the same environment, same area. So it does have, it grows from Central California and Naomi can go more into that, Central Southern and into Baja. So it does have its range, so it doesn't grow anywhere. Threatening the fact again, because of development as well. So this plant, um, so again, cautioning you there, just for information about that. When you want to gather this, it's probably now, no later than before summer, because this is when the leaves are nice and plump. And this is when you're going to be able to, um, when it's going to be in its nice growing period, you can dry them out, store them that way. You can make your solves or whatever, or you want to do with it medication on it, or use it for cooking, or use it like you would do any other kind of sage in your in your chicken or pork, whatever you want to cook as well um, with it. But again, when the plant is dormant, usually in the summertime or not a lot of rain, unless it gets a little rain, it's going to look almost kind of dead. When the seeds, you'll see when the seeds are ripe, you can go back once or twice to go gather when this, as these pods start drying out, you come to gather them. Um, also better if you roast the seeds a little bit then grind in the old blender, you can make a little flour out of this as well. So um, the Kawea would use, um, no, not this one, I was gonna say that, they would have used, never mind. They would have used the um, elderberry and the chia to make a pudding. But that was way back, it just came back to me. But this again, the seed was also among many native people here used as a food source as well and as a medicinal plant there. So again, something that we encourage an abundant, again, a big bee supports a lot of bees. A lot of good honey comes out of this, this species. Uh, if you go out right now, go hiking in the background now, now that the trails are open for us. I was out there last, yesterday and you could just hear the bees by the thousands up there just going for the honey on this. So again, a big honey producer for us on the United States. Um, it's one of the plants that produce a lot of sage honey for that one. So again, Cheers to that, delicious. <laughs> Thank you, Abe. And Naomi, could you take us through the ecology? Sure, so Abe mentioned how this is a great honey producing plant. So the scientific name for this plant is Salvia mellifera, and it shares um, the last part of its scientific name, the specific epithet, it shares that with the honeybee. 
So the honeybee's name is Apis mellifera. And that component of the scientific name mellifera um, means um, honey bearing. So it is known, it has been known to be a very good honey producing plant. Um, honeybees do love it and it produces great nectar for many insects. So it's a great uh, plant for pollinators. Um, its common name is black sage and it's called black sage um, because the leaves are much darker and that's in contrast to the white sage which has a very whitish colored leaves due to the, the hairs that are on it. Um, this species um, is a dominant component of the coastal sage scrub uh, and so coastal sage scrub is called coastal sage scrub because it has many sage species including true sages like salvia mellifera and white sage salvia apiana as well as sagebrush. Um, and so this is a true sage and um, it really, this species thrives in very hot, sunny and dry soils. So if you plant this in your garden and you're local to our area in and around Claremont and Pomona Valley area, this plant would just absolutely thrive without any supplemental water because it's one of our local species and it's adapted to our climate. Um, so it's a great plant. Um, one of my favorite uh, smelling sages. I just I can't help but you just have to touch the leaves and smell your hands to get that essence. Right. Yeah, I love black sage so much. And I think I even saw in the question and answers, uh, the, the, there's a selection of black sage called terra seca, salvia mellifera terra seca. And I have some of that in my front yard. Beautiful ground cover, kind of like this emerald carpet. But yeah, you can use the leaves in, in the same recipe. Uh, it's a selection, meaning it's not a hybrid between two different sages in theory. Um, and it's a, a, a wonderful plant because the straight salvia mellifera black sage can get pretty sprawling. And that's wonderful too. I have a straight uh, black sage uh, species in my backyard. <laughs> so all types of applications. Um, so yeah, I love black sage so much. Um, so thank you guys so much for joining us on this wonderful Taste Wild event. Um, I hope you found it wonderful. I hope you found these desserts fabulous. The information from Abe and Naomi great. And we're going to make some closing remarks here. Uh, one thing I want to say again is I just, I find it so inspiring, the advice from the Chia Cafe Collective. One thing that Craig Torres, a member of, of, of that group, has said, again, is it's uh, native plants are more about natural relationships than they are about natural resources. And we can grow these plants in our own yards, in our own pots. Here at California Botanic Garden, we really stress that you should not be foraging out in our wildlands. Um, these habitats are already challenged by things like urban development and climate change and other possible foragers. So we want to protect uh, these places um, from that type of uh, destruction. And we also want to, you know, provide these beautiful places for our pollinators and other uh, fauna to enjoy. So it's, it's a, a great journey to start bringing native plants into your yard because when you take care of them, you'll find that you really develop this relationship with them. You want to take care of them and they'll provide you with this fabulous, uh, these fabulous ingredients, uh, ingredients for dishes and uh, other, other foods. So it's um, a really great journey to embark on. You're going to kill many things. <laughs> um, I have, I have uh, ruined my fair share of sages and things like that, but through trial and error, you'll get, you'll get the hang of it. And uh, it's always great to try things out in pots, you know, so like the, again, the bay, Bay Laurel, unless you have a pretty big space, you're going to want to think about a pot. Um, but here at California Botanic Garden, we have a lot of expert staff. If you email our info email address with any kind of horticulture questions, we're pretty quick to respond. And I want to say that our Grow Native Nursery is indeed open just virtually. So you can visit that on our website at www.calbg.org. And there's a big button there and you can uh, buy plants. And so we're open for curbside pickup on a set number of days with a reservation system. And so some, several of these plants we've talked about are available online and our inventory does get updated. So stay tuned if your favorite's not there. Um, so yeah, so we're, we're here, we're here as a resource for you in terms of our native plants. And uh, we're, we're doing um, a lot, both in terms of conservation out in the field through Naomi, as well as public engagement and horticulture here on the grounds at our 86 acre botanic garden. So we know that we're closed right now, but we're planning a gradual reopening uh, starting next week. So stay tuned for details about that. Um, and uh, as I close out, I, I want to um, just tremendously thank Naomi Fraga for joining us. I want to tremendously thank Phyllis for just, again, cooking all of these fabulous desserts. Thank you so much. They've just been Welcome. such a delicious treat. And um, I want to thank Danielle, my, my teammate here. And I want to close this out by throwing it back to Abe and just uh, asking Abe, what should we leave here, what this event tastes wild with? What what knowledge and uh, maybe insights about native food should we most remember? 
Well, I think just the importance of Bjorn is that as we, our population increases and so forth, and you know, there's a concern about that with development and these plants. And, and I think the important thing is like many of us can grow these in our yard, you know, um, bring them back. I mean, not only are you gonna attract animals, you're gonna help the, the environment. Um, and I am really ecstatic the fact that Phyllis, you took this and you, know, you followed some of these recipes. You, I mean, our cook, we have our recipes in our cookbook. We have a certain amount of recipes. Not that this is the Bible on Southern California native cooking. I mean, it's beyond. We're hoping people just continue. It's the mesquite flour. There's a lot of things you can do with mesquite, mesquite flour. Seriously, I really believe mesquite is an example. It's something that's gonna, save, it's gonna help save hunger in the world. I mean, it grows in poor soils. It grows in poor lands. I mean, and then it's like, and why are we utilizing this today? So that these foods that are available there, and again, it's just us, us and this helps us learn how to taste these foods again, get, you know, we will be accustomed to it and find out how we can. But again, being, um, you know, making it sustainable, being, you know, careful on how we're going to harvest these plants and growing them, whatever it might be that we're going to take there so i'm and i'm sure the rest of the group cafe collectors is ecstatic about this because it's not only about this and you get to mention myself i go but you know it's, it's the 10 of us and um in our collective and um it's all of us who just made that effort on how we can make this um you know how we can improve this you know i was um just recently we had this horrible red red tide at the beach at the coast all these rains the tide looked like mud on the water and i looked what caused the red tide and it's supposedly, I don't know, I, mean, I would read that, uh, that it's because of everybody's fertilizers that's washing into the water or something, whatever, and it's causing this red tide. And they were encouraged, plant native plants. You know, plant your native plants is what it is, because we, you know, we put pavement and blacktop all over this land, and, and we're using too much of that fertilizer stuff. So anyway, that was kind of disturbing to me. But yeah, it's, um, it, it's, you know, the sky is the limit with these foods, you know, for, you know, sustainable and fair and careful on as we take care of these, um, it's out there. And I think these are things that we have to look for in the future. I mean, there's, there's, we have to look, instead of importing foods from all over the world, and we have a lot of these foods. And I keep on referring back to my favorite, mesquite. It's just, there's just this food source. It's just getting us used to, you know, making a demand for it. As you all remember, chia back in the day, nobody knew what chia was. Now there's this big demand, everybody's eating chia. If we can do the same thing with the mesquite, I mean, that's something that we can go and bring back. And again, it's the benefits of that. But again, it's the main the important part there is again, teaching us on how to enjoy, how to eat it. Because the big thing is, you know, this is good, but the big question I'm always says, well then, if it's good for you and it's this, you know, how do you eat it? Well, this is a very good example that we had here. You know, how do you eat it? Um, Phil is implemented into these common recipes that we're all familiar with using some of these ingredients. But hopefully someday you'll be able to eat them with full, more full dose. I mean, I, you're gonna, I mean, you can even make more, um, put more of the bay leaf, right, Phyllis? You can even make yeah. it more, you know, whatever you could. I mean, depending, but this, what I like about this, this is a beautiful introduction into just that mild little flavor. And all depends on your taste buds and how, where you want to take it. So um, yes, definitely. Um, these are foods that we need to look right under our nose and we need to um, respect them and hopefully start using them in a safe way for them. Thank you so much, Abe. And before we close out, I'm hoping all of the panelists here can spend about eight minutes uh, answering some questions. Is that all right? Yeah. All right, yeah. uh, Danielle, do you want to ask? We have some questions. Okay, I will start at the top. Um, first one, Good one, I don't know the answer to. Someone is asking if the native California bay is the same tree that's used as the street tree throughout Claremont. Does, does anybody happen to know? I don't know. I wish I had a Claremont street tree list. I live in California. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Google, so. where's Google? <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think so. I, I don't I, think it is. I love bay laurel, I would notice if there were. We should change it though. <laughs> we should make it a, a city tree. There's a lot of live oak out there, isn't there? Live oak on the street? Yeah, there are some live oak. There's some kind of weird hybrid sycamores. There's a uh, jacaranda. Yeah. yeah, the jacaranda are quite popular. Okay, so our next question is for Phyllis. Someone yes. asked, uh, they said that they noticed on the recipe card here that the bay is added to the belted, the the bay leaves are added to the melted butter and then removed. They're wondering um, why we did this as opposed to adding it as a grounded up spice. It, it again, is, it's really strong. Um, 
I didn't want to overpower it. Um, so uh, quite a bit of the bay flavor gets into the butter it just by melting the butter and letting it sit there for about an hour. If you want a stronger flavor, you can actually take a little part of the bay leaf or take one of those bay leaves and put it in the bottom of the um, of your baking dish before you put the batter in. So that will actually, when it's cooking, it'll it'll still you know infuse the batter a little bit more. And then you have kind of a fun thing on the bottom of the pan um, when you turn it out. So. Um, yeah, so and I'm, I'm also wondering if um, the flavor could be toned down by drying the bay leaves. Um, I did not try that, um, but I know that most of the time when, unless you happen to have a, a traditional bay leaf tree, um, we all are very used to using the dried bay leaves in cooking. So um, that might be another way to, to change the flavor a little bit and make it a little more subtle. Um, so just some thoughts on that one. So another question, Phyllis, the, um, the bay leaves are popular. <laughs> um, so the next one was, how did you handle working with the bay leaves? Um, did you cook them? I know you mentioned you didn't dry them. Did you just I didn't, yeah. put them right into, the, right into the butter? Yeah, so you just um, melt the butter in a skillet and put the bay leaves in there. I didn't really cook them. I just turned the heat off and let the butter, the warm butter, um, kind of pull the flavor out of the bay leaves for an hour. And I, I, I didn't like throwing them out. I was like, shoot, <laughs> you know, but I did, <laughs> so. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're really easy to work with. Um, they seem very water repellent. So you just wash them off, pat them dry um, and go right in the butter. So, yeah. All right, let's see. Somebody else asked, can you microwave the chocolate chips for the fudge? Yes, you can also do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, glass bowl. Oh. Yep. The fudge, another popular one. Where do you find these beautiful crumbled dragon fruit chips? Okay, so um, Trader Joe's is very close to the California Botanic Garden, so I'm going <laughs> to plug them. <laughs> they had a lot of fun dried fruits. Um, I thought that looked really interesting, and it is a, um, a fruit from a succulent, so I thought, well, let's try that. And the color was great, so we went with that. Great, great. Oh, Trader Joe's. <laughs> <laughs> let's see. Somebody asked, um, let's see, I, they asked, what is the fruit on the top besides the leaves? I'm wondering if that was about the bay again. Was there, was that when we were talking about the little avocado relative on the, on the bay laurel? Someone was asking about that. Yeah, that sounds about, that sounds right. Yeah. Naomi, you want to cover that? Yeah, that, that's the fruit of the bay tree. They make these little berries that look like avocados. And you can eat them. You can roast them. The, the, the seed inside, the nut. All right, good to know. Let's see, we already answered this one. Can any of these plants be purchased through the Botanic Garden? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Check out our website, calbg.org. Click on the purple order plants button and you can check those out. I want to I want to throw in there too like we might be out of a particular plant but uh, many of the salvia the sage species are great for different types of recipes and different types of uh, culinary applications so Cleveland sage for instance is really really great. Um, there's many different types of uh, cultivars of that so don't don't be disappointed if you can't find like black sage but uh, yeah hummingbird sage Ooh. oh right mm. right absolutely. So that's another question I have in front of me. Yes, you can substitute. Someone was asking if white sage would be substituted for the black sage in recipes. Hummingbird sage, you said. I mean, white sage is a lot stronger, so you might want to like not dive into white sage right away. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, someone is asking, Abe, is the Chia Cafe Collective a brick and mortar place? No, good question. Needless to say, we just have a little name, but we're not a, um, we're not a cafe. We're more just... Um, Ed, we're educators and encouraging people to, um, like I said, explore the whole native comp, um, you know, compounds of these foods. But no, we're not, um, and um, not a um, restaurant. Okay, great, good to know. Let's see. Um, someone is asking of the four plants we talked about today, which one would we recommend to plant by a walkway to um, have the highest aroma or fragrance takeaway? I'd recommend the black sage. 
I think, so one of my favorite, I have um, a sage that grows near my driveway. And as I walk to my car, sometimes I brush against it and I feel like I get a little bit of perfume for the day. <laughs> so. Oh, I love that. It kind of depends what you're going for too. Like if you have kind of a more Mediterranean style garden, the bay laurel's great. You just kind of have to keep it contained. Um, I, one of my favorite aromas, we didn't talk about it today, but um, fragrant pitcher sage, which is not actually a sage, lepicinia. Uh, but it is so aromatic and we have, I have actually trellised it in our backyard and it's just highly aromatic and really, really a pleasant smelling plant. But it can grow big though too. So they have to be careful where they put it. It can, it can, it, once it gets, it gets established, it does continue to grow. So um, you may not want it growing into your sidewalk or your pavement. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's see here. We had another one. I just passed it. Uh, Phyllis, the folks want to know if you provide these native desserts on your catering menu. Not yet, but we're happy to. <laughs> sure. <laughs> That's what kind of our specialty is saying yes. So yeah. <laughs> I, I, as long as we can get the ingredients. I mean, I do have the elderflower tree. I have a different species of mesquite. Um, I think it's a velvet mesquite, so I don't know if that would work the same way. Doesn't seem like it. But yeah, as long as we can get the ingredients, yes. Great, great, good to know. Let's see, we, I have been assured several times that the bay laurel is not the tree <laughs> um, on the California streets. Although somebody said they think that they're using it as the new street tree. So I guess we will look into that. Um, let's see, we also have somebody asking almond flower versus mesquite flower. Pros and cons? I, I would say that, uh, well, mesquite flower is a native plant that requires less water than almond trees. So that's something to think about in terms of sustainable agriculture. What might be um, the, the plant you like? Aside from that, there are different textures and flavors. Um, so you might not use them in the same way. Right, great. And then somebody said that they love the sage aroma at the Claremont Wilderness area. Do we know what type of sage is up there? There are new um, multiple sages. Um, certainly the black sage is up there, the white sage is up there. Um, so those are our two common local sages that you would commonly find. All right, great. Let's see. Do, do, do. Oh, here we go. We have an answer. The street tree for Claremont is the camper tree. C-A-M-P-H-O-R, camper tree. So. One of some. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, we have another one. Let's see. Is the elderberry the same that is used in the elderberry gummies that some people take for colds? Uh, so, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I would probably, but good morning, Naomi. Well, it's... Um, the European species that is commonly used in these products, it's the same species, but not the same subspecies. Um, so Sambucus nigra um, is used in ingredients for uh, medicinal purposes. All righty, great. I think looks like it wraps it up uh, with the questions on my end. All right, fabulous. Well, thank you everyone. Thank you all the panelists. You've been such a pleasure. And thank you everyone who tuned in and enjoyed these desserts. So we really, really appreciate it. And we hope to see you back either here at the garden or on some of more of these virtual programs. So thank you so much and take care. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.